Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, so you see uh, the title is uh, a bit kind of orthogonal to the main theme of the workshop. So I'm not going to use tensor networks to solve computational problems, but I'll try to solve some analytical problems using tensor networks or some related uh, <clears throat> structures. And uh, well, maybe there will be also some interest <coughs> for the general <coughs> public. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a short, up, short outline of my talk. Uh, basically, I'm trying to use these 30 minutes for a very sketchy overview of some uh, recent results, which we kind of came across in our group. And these are the two main heroes which are responsible for those, those results. Bruno Bertini, who was a postdoc in our group for the past three years, uh, now in Oxford, and uh, Pavel Kos, who was a PhD student, who has now just submitted his thesis. So that's basically <clears throat> uh, the work of this uh, well, our three, group of, th uh, of three. And uh, um, and uh, the, 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 the kind of the buzzword, uh, the keyword, if you have, if you just, you know, if you want to take one buzzword from this talk, this is dual unitarity. So I try to kind of uh, motivate you why should be why you could be excited about particular kind of quantum circuits, uh, brickwork quantum circuits, which we call dual unitary, and that, that there are interesting examples of those, in, interesting examples of those, which have in, interesting properties, yeah? Um, and uh, if you want a more general motivation, why I'm kind of interested about in this type of uh, particular fine-tuned examples, I mean, you could argue these are fine-tuned chaotic systems, indeed, but um, there are kind of, there are at least two reasons why I'm excited about those. And the first is um, that, you know, <clears throat> when you kind of learn many body physics, you know, you find that there are complicated models which require very sophisticated uh, numerical techniques to deal with. And uh, it's very hard to, 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 to make any analytical progress unless you are free or integrable. And when, when you are kind of uh, taking course in dynamical systems or this in popular words, chaos theory, you immediately get, uh, are taught about uh, very simple models like Baker maps and cat maps, which can be solved by pen and pencil, uh, by, by, by paper and pencil. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's very easy to compute correlation functions analytically, even though those models definitely are chaotic in the sense that they have a butterfly effect, they have unpredictable trajectories and so on. So in statistical sense, they're exactly solvable, but even though trajectories are chaotic. Yeah? So, I mean, uh, we are actually, I mean, our, our motivation is exactly to look for models like that in, in, in many body physics. So to have models which are statistically exactly solvable, even though they are kind of chaotic, yeah? even though they, for example, behave like random matrices, right? I mean, now, <clears throat> if you want definition, I mean, of course, that now in the least, recent five years or so, we have witnessed a lot of interest for quantum chaos coming mainly from high energy physics. And there, you know, we've probably learned about autox and all that. I'm not talking about autox here. I'm talking about spectral statistics. I'm talking about links to random matrices. <clears throat> so for example, you have these very simple models. Uh, what is quite surprising is that the, the generators of these of this time evolutions can be in many ways understood. I mean, their statistical, I mean, let's say the spectral statistics are in many ways equivalent to, 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 to spectral random matrices, even though this, these propagators have, 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 are very structured. I mean, they are sparse matrices, you know, they are very systematic, non-random and so on. <clears throat> so it would, be very, it would be great to have a model for which you can prove that you get random matrix statistics. And we are very excited uh, that we could report in 2018 in this PRL, which I list here, kind of the first result of that type. So this was the kick teasing chain with some <clears throat> tilted magnetic fields, which you could average over and you get ex analytic results, which uh, basically reproduce random matrix statistics. I mean, at least in some limits, in let's say in thermodynamic limit and in appropriate time scales or energy scales, if you want, you get, you get precise results of random matrices. <clears throat> and then, I mean, I'm not going to go into any detail of that paper because it would be too much for this talk. But as I said, I will try to cover <clears throat> what, I, what I think is the most abstract and the most overviewing uh, concept, which is the dual unitarity. I mean, this particular model, this kick-teasing model is an example of dual unitary circuits. I'm trying to you know, define this for you precisely in the next slide. And for those models, you could do dynamics. You could compute dynamics of two-point functions exactly. These models are not trivial. I mean, you, you could say, you could immediately be misled to a, to a conclusion that this, this dynamics is trivial because you can, you, you can reduce uh, dynamics of two point correlations to a zero dimensional map, completely positive map. But you see, I mean, if you, you can compute, I, I mean, you can compute, for example, complexity of, uh, of time depending operators and so, so on, and you find that the operator entanglement, for example, grows logarithmic or grows linear in this system. So, I mean, the, the, the operator squaring is kind of the same as, as for, it's even, Kind of okay. It's it's of the same, let's say, universality class or, or complexity class as for generic generic random circuits. If you want. 
Anyway, and the third kind of motivating uh, point for, 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 for my kind of excitement about this topic is uh, encapsulated in the third group of papers. The, 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 the most uh, kind of uh, important is probably the last contribution in which was published in PRX a month, a month ago, uh, where we kind of showed some sort of structural stability of this type of results. So, I mean, you can think of, okay, I mean, this is fine-tuned models, yes. But also integrable systems are fine-tuned, free systems are fine-tuned. So, and then you shake them, you introduce perturbations. The question is, what remains of those integral physics, right? And you know that free and integrable models are very sensitive. So that basically most of physics is gone immediately. Now, here we actually hope something contrary. Here we hope that these models are structurally stable so that we could maybe prove some you know, some, 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 perturb some, some sort of convergence results on perturbation series. And we can actually do that in a very limited context. And that's gonna kind of <clears throat> the, the last part of my talk. So I hope I have at least five minutes for that. So, because I think this is mo the most exciting part. Anyway, <clears throat> but let me, let, let me start to, st to start slowly. So let me define this, 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 this buzzword for you, this dual unitary circuits. So, I mean, what is this? I mean, this is maybe related to, you know, for some of you at least who know about perfect tensors, it's a bit related to perfect tensors, even though it's a weaker property. So it's kind of more generic. So, I mean, in, assume that you have a, a, a two, like, let's say, I mean, we'll just discuss this in the context of, 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 of brickwork quantum gates. So let's just discuss two particle gates, which I denote by letter U, Roman U. And a, a gate can be understood as a kind of a two, a scat, a two particle scattering operator, which takes states I and J, Right? I mean, these states are all qubits of finite, uh, finite D, uh, D level quantum systems. So you have a tensor product of two qubit uh, Hilbert spaces. And then you have states I and J, which are getting mapped to states K and L. And these are, this is, you know, this is done by a unitary transformation. Right. But now you can just consider why, what about if I just consider this evolution not in the vertical? I mean, my, my time is always vertical. So my circuits will be always drawn in uh, such that, that the time flows vertically. But now assume that this. You know, you could consider also the time goes horizontally. So then it's, you could just replace space and time, for example, right? And, and then you could just consider this as a, as a quantum protocol, uh, which, which goes left to right. Now, the question is under what condition this, this map is unitary when you take in states i and k and, and take j and l as out states. So in this way, you could just define a, a, a kind of reshuffling of indices, which we denote as tilde operation, which maps a unitary to another operator, which is u tilde, which might not be unitary. Now you can ask yourself, okay, but suppose that that other operator, which you call utilda, is unitary as well. So you ask that this small operator is unitary and it's a space-time reshuffling operator is unitary as well. And uh, this, is, this is what we call dual unitarity. So, I mean, <clears throat> I will later classify completely the dual unitary gates for qubits for you and you will see that they are not as fine-tuned as you might uh, get worried. And, uh, but okay, I'll come to that. But let me just try now to just give you some simple pictures of how we can understand this dual unitarity. <coughs> dual unitarity. I mean, we, basically what we'll do, we'll try to contract tensor networks. So we need some simple diagrams which will allow us to, to simplify tensor networks. And it turns out that if you have tensor networks composed of these uh, unitar dual unitary uh, evolutions, then a lot, can be, a lot can be simplified. For example, I mean, first you need to, unitarity is just that, you know, assume now I will, take, I will, I will make a red box by the no, for denoting a, a unitary gate, and I will make a blue box for denoting its Hermitian conjugate. Now, if you place a, a red on top of the blue and contract, or, or, or blue on top of the red, you get just two state wires, which, is, which means identity. This is what we call, for example, forward fusion rules. But you get also side, sideways or dual fusion rules when you contract the sideways wires, side, sideways wires, which is, which is like you know these two diagrams here, which is exactly these two expression these two expressions here, right? So now, <clears throat> okay. I mean, I'm, as I say, I mean, I have just thirty minutes, so I'm not going to go into real calculations here. But you could, you could, as I guess, you could easily get the idea how this now allows you to simplify things. <clears throat> For example, now, and you see, I mean, I also on purpose draw these circuit, uh, these diagrams of quantum circuits in a bit different ways that people usually do. I mean, I, 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 I on purpose always denote uh, my wires by, by 45 degree angles so that it's very easy to imagine this uh, space-time flips, right? I mean, you could just read it sideways or, or, or upwards. <clears throat> now, for example, this would be just a, a piece of a quantum circuit which would just have two time steps. I mean, also for most of my kind of <clears throat> uh, 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 calculations, I would assume that this is Floquet quantum circuit, that all gates are the same. And for example, it's translation invariant, at least for most of, most of my calculations. <clears throat> so, so assume that now you have just a single gate, single red gate, 
and then you place it in a symmet interstitially symmetrical fashion, and then you repeat it in time. So for example, this would be like a two time steps. I mean, this is depth two circuit. So it's uh, two repetitions of depth two circuit. And it's like six unit cells in space. So this would be like two times six uh, array, right? And uh, you know, you could just think of this as a partition function. I mean, for example, I mean, what we will really like to do later is to compute traces. So for example, trace of u to the t is like a partition function. In particular, if this is periodic boundaries, then this partition function can be thought of as partition function where you contract it along rows and the row transfer matrix is just the usual propagator u, which I write in standard fashion, like a even tensor product and shift an odd tensor product and an inverse shift. But you could always also understand it as a, as a contraction over column. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Um, I mean, as a column uh, uh, transfer matrix expression for the, of a partition function. So the column transfer matrix is what I called U tilde. Okay, I mean, I, I pointed in the wrong formula. I mean, the forward evolution is just uh, the space, evo the time evolution is just this one, and uh, the space evolution is just this one. <clears throat> and again, the, uh, the, 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 the space propagator is formed by, 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 by you know, by, by the, the space time flipped uh, dual unitary gate. Now, of course, if the, you can always do this for generic gates, for example. I mean, if you do this for generic gates, and actually there are interesting uh, results recently, I mean, by Vedika Kemani and Politi and uh, Tarum Grover, I think. I mean, people uh, are really considering this dual space-time dual. And even if the, the, the space dual is not unitary, they sometimes can show that it, ma it gets mapped to an interesting evolution, for example, uh, to these projected measurements. Uh, I mean, evolution is with projected measurements. So it's really a, 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 a physics evolution, yeah? <clears throat> And, and of course, I mean, then it, you know you can you can try to ask yourself, I mean, what really corresponds to uh, uh, to that uh, evolution with measurements in the in the in the dual picture, <clears throat> which might be unitary. But in any case, I mean, I try I, I try to make my life simple here, and I I consider only dual unitary evolutions, so that evolutions are unitary in both orthogonal directions. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so now uh, this is kind of the general context in which you could you could understand our first results on self-dual kick teasing model, which is much more technical and much more convoluted. So it would be very much harder to explain it, explain it in a 30 minute talk. So I'm not even going to, to try, uh, <clears throat> but, but the results like that was actually basically based on the fact that we could actually now use, use this duality of traces to, 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 to express the spectral form factor, which I will show you. This is, uh, this is what I will show you in the next slide can be formulated in terms of traces of the propagators. And a similar kind of uh, <clears throat> a similar uh, uh, kind of interpretation of our, our of our first result in terms of dual unitarity has also been put put forward by by, by Sarank and, and Austin in, in 2019 in this reference. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so now I'm just giving you one or two slides on spectral form factor because this is kind of the simplest object that you could think of. I mean, apart from correlation functions, this is the spectral correlation function if you want. So the idea is now you know. To, 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 to discuss uh, spectral statistics. So the simplest uh, kind of uh, uh, property of, of correlation property of, of, of energy spectra. And in this case, since we are talking about uh, discrete time evolution or Floch evolution, uh, the spectra we have to consider are spectra of unitary operators, the Floch operators. So imagine that you have a unitary operator. Now I'm just denoting it in general U as U. Then you have its spectrum, which I denote as phi sub n, and this spectrum is uh, composed of uh, you know, points on a unit circle. Then you can define a spectral density, and the two-point function of spectral density is sort of uh, R of theta. I mean, it's the, 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 the simplest uh, correlation function you can imagine. It's a density-density correlation function of the quasi-energy spectrum. And its Fourier transform is what people refer to as spectral form factor. Now, if you do this two-line calculation, I mean, I'm not good on going to do it. I just flash it here, but it's really an elementary calculation, which uh, you know allows you to 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 check the spectral form factor, which is the Fourier transform of two-point function, is just trace of u to the t modulus square. So now, if you can compute traces of the propagator, as we, as I showed in the previous slide, are just partition functions of these simple vertex models. But the point is, of course, you have to do it twice. You have to do it in two replicas, and then you know you have to compute trace of u to the t modulus square. And then do some sort of averaging because this object, as it is well known, is not self averaging. So you have to compute some sort of averaging. Now, this averaging can be very innocent. It can be averaging over some very small random fields or averaging over time, moving, moving averages over time and so on. But, but uh, the object itself without averaging is not, doesn't make much sense. I mean, it doesn't make much sense. It's not, you know, it fluctuates wildly. <clears throat> 
And if you just, uh, you know, read in the textbooks like Meta, or for example, I mean, what the random matrix uh, theory tells you about this spectral form factor, you get very simple results. For example, I mean, there are these uh, <clears throat> two main ensembles of random matrices, depending on whether your system has or doesn't have time reversal symmetry, which are referred to as circular orthogonal or circular unitary ensemble. And in this case, you get the spectral form factor has this linear ramp for times, which are not extremely long. And the slope of the ramp is either one or two, depending on whether you don't have or have time reversal. <clears throat> so for example, this is a simple sketch of the spectral form factor. And the curly n for me is the Hilbert space dimension. So in our case, it was just two to the L in the, in the, spin, uh, in the spin chain, for example, of L sites. And uh, then what you get typically for, a, for example, for unitary case is simply a linear ramp. And then at, at the time, which is also referred to as the Heisenberg time, which is the inverse mean level spacing, you get a plateau. And for the time reversal invariant systems, you get twice the slope and some, you know, some <coughs> non-flat. I mean, this, this is piecewise linear, but this one has some, some smooth, smooth dependence, yeah. <coughs> okay, so now- to, to just make sure, so for, you, you said it's not self-averaging. Uh, and so you're averaging now over um, unitaries, right? From the given ensemble. Or... Right, right. I mean, this is, this is of course, yeah. This is averaging over unitaries. So this is random matrix result. Random matrix result right. is basically, yeah, it's a statistical ensemble of, of matrices here. Yeah. So, so what do you mean by it's not self-averaging in the previous? Well, I mean, it's not self-averaging for, for, let's say, for dynamical systems, for, for, for your model. I mean, you have your favorite model, you pick it, you, you compute trace of u to the t, you compute uh, the modulus square, you plot it, and it's all over the place. Okay. Then, then, okay, then you can do two things. Either you do averages over parameters of the model, and that usually helps already, or you, or you do moving time averages, and that also helps. But okay. just, you know, the sign of warning is that this, this object is very fragile. I mean, if, unless you do any averaging, uh, it is not, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, and then, of course, this object is also, I mean, I'm trying to advocate for this object also for, let's say, people who can do some, you know, who can measure these things experimentally. I mean, this object is very sensitive to chaos. For example, if you take your integrable, your favorite integrable model, compute spectral form factor, of course, it's wildly oscillating. But if you can, if you, if you do some sort of averaging, then you'll get a plateau around N. And then if you look at a many body system, you know, at short times, this is exponential gap. I mean, this is two to the L, and this is something which is of the order of T for short times, you know, much, much less than two to the L. This is, you know, exponential gap. So, I mean, this is, you know, if, if you could measure, you know, a uh, spectral form factor for short times between different evolutions, then this will give you a very sensitive probe of chaos. Then, of course, there is this uh, caveat, which I feel tempted to, 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 to sweep under the rug here, but I still want to mention it. I mean, there is this time scale before which the random matrices cannot apply. This is usually referred to as, as tauless time. So there's, you know, there is a regime, there is a time in, after which universality can set, be hoped to set in, but before that time, you'll get system dependent features which are not random matrix like. And the main question in this, this, this game is also how this tauless time depends on the system size or the system properties. Now, for the models that I'm advocating here, these dual unitary models, it turns out that this tauless time it actually does not depend on, on anything and it's basically zero. So which means that these models are kind of chaotic critical models since they are behave, uh, agreeing with random matrices at all time scales. There is no universality uh, uh, threshold, but basically they are universal at all times. I mean, this is just, you know, I'm, I'm not giving you, I mean, I, I flash you that, I, I flash you later a, 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 a statement of the theorem, but I'm not going into any further details on that. Okay, yeah, I'm just, uh, I just mentioned the theorem, so I'm here. So, I mean, <clears throat> this is basically a very recent result, which is kind of generalizing our first result on the kick teasing model and much more because it basically is a result about a class of unit, dual unitary circuits. So, I mean, imagine now you have a, a, a generic dual unitary circuit, which, you know, for, for, for concreteness, you can think of it's generated by translation invariant pair of gates. I denote here by orange, by, by, by red and orange gate. So they could be different in two half time steps. And then you compose them by random uh, uh, SU2 gates or SUD gates or UD gates, if you want. So these guys are local qubits, local qubit gates, which are unitary, but random. Now, the statement is the following. I mean, this distribution of this SU, now this is the statement is essentially explicit for qubits and, and uh, it can be also written for qubits, but then it applies only to a subclass of dual unitaries. But for qubits, it's general. It applies for all the unitaries. So the point is the following. Suppose you, get, you take any distrib IID distribution of local qubit, qubit gates, U, which you place here with this uh, blue. And the, the fact that you have put different shades of blue means I had to take different gates. This is a random, a random realization. 
But now you see, I mean, the, the really cool, cool part of this theorem is that basically the theorem is true. And the theorem says the following, the thermodynamic limit of spectral form factor equals the dimension of the commutant of some set of operators. That is the, the, the dimension of the space of, of, our, of the algebra of operators which simultaneously commute with this set. And this is equal to T. Now this, 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 this set of operators is defined on the lattice of T sites. This is because we use this space-time duality trick in between. So basically, we map the problem on the problem of spin chain on T sites. And basically, I mean, the fact that we have T is basically a consequence of transla translational symmetry in time. So you get basically the commutant of this algebra is basically expanded by translations, by T translations on T sites. So there, there is, you know, it's the dimension is T. Yeah. But, you know, uh, but the point is, I mean, there was a point I wanted to make, but I slightly forgot, forgot about it. But 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 the point is that uh, the point is that that, that that this distribution distribution of unitary gates could be arbitrarily arbitrarily narrow around identity. So it means you could basically have very weak noise. Once you do the thermodynamic limit, you know if you do the thermodynamic limit first, you can do the noise to zero limit later, and the result still applies. The, the point is, of course, this pair these two limits don't apply, don't commute. But you see, I mean, you know, there is no, there is no critical disorder. This order could be arbitrarily small, and you still get this result. So it means that these models cannot be many body localized if you have dual unitary gates as, 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 as a basis. That's a strict result. Okay. <clears throat> Please interrupt me if there is any question. I mean, I don't know. How actually, actually, so so you said the commutant here. The only thing that remains are the translations. Yeah. So this is uh... right. In this case, they are just uh, linear span span of translations. Yeah. Now, if you have time translation symmetry, now in this Kip-Teasing model, there was also time translation, right? I mean, uh, sorry, uh, time reversal symmetry. You have time reversal symmetry, then you get basically reflections plus translations, right? You have the hydro group of which has two T elements. That's and why. The, and the content of the theorem is now that okay, if you build any Hamiltonian from these types of terms, uh, sorry, yeah. any unitary sort of from these types of terms, then you know, okay, this is uh, you automatically get sort of to this. Caudic right. regime, basically. Right, right. And and, and of course, it doesn't it doesn't tell you about finite size effects. I mean, this is the thermodynamic limit result. So you know, if you could get arbitrarily strong finite size effects, I mean, I could show you some numerics. Usually, it works very well. But you know, it's all about. I mean, you you construct some sort of transfer matrix, and it's the, another thing is to show that this. The, I mean, first thing is to show that this transfer matrix has an eigenvalue one, which is default degenerate. And the second, so basically this is this is the, the idea is here in this line, but probably I wanted to skip it because I had to rush on. But you know, that the idea is basically that you you define spectral form factor of system of time t and size L as the L fold trace of the L fold product of some log of some transfer matrix. Now this thing is a is it <coughs> and is it and important now? to include the single side terms? Um, so this sum over sigma alphas. No, I don't mean to random guess. Yeah, there. These ones, yeah, I think yes, I think yes. Huh, interesting. Okay, but that, that's that's detail. So I think I suggest we discuss this in breakout room. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. That, <clears throat> that would get us too far, but yeah. <clears throat> okay. In any case, so I just wanted to say, okay, now I mean the, the idea of this calculation is basically you use this space time flip uh, to move this averaging inside the power. You see, I mean here you have the averaging over the uh, uh, expectation value over the uh, quench disorder, which is kind of a, a horrible thing, right? But then you do the space-time flip, and then you move the averaging inside, so which means that you define the transfer matrix with the local averaging, and then you do it to power L. So you see, averaging is now basically IID. I mean, the fact that you have IID noise, uh, um, IID uh, 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 disorder, now maps to a kind of noise in space. So basically, you do averages locally, and then you power it to, to L. And now the, the only thing you have to show is now that, that this is a transfer matrix which, which has an eigenvalue one which you can control, which you can characterize completely. I mean, the eigenspace of eigenvalue one you can characterize completely. And the second step is to show that this has a gap. And this is, this is what this we can do, but we cannot quantify the gap. Quantifying the gap would mean, would mean to control the, um, the finite size corrections, but that, that's beyond the theorem. Okay, <clears throat> now the next thing to do, how much how am I doing with time, Thomas? I'm just to... About, I would say, seven more minutes or so. OK, so I have to hurry up now. So I mean, yeah, then the next uh, kind of nice, uh, cool thing you can do with this dual unitary is to compute correlation functions, which I already announced in the beginning. And this I'm going to go really quick, I guess, because I'd like to save some time for the, for the perturbation stability. But you know, the, the idea is, OK, let's just write your favorite correlation function like this. I mean, this is like a tensor of all possible correlations, for example, for the circuit of curates, where this a 
alpha and a beta are the Hilbert Schmidt orthogonal set of orthogonal operators like uh, Pauli matrices or Riemann matrices or whatever. So a zero is identity and a alpha, alpha different from zero are traces operators. So now imagine this is like a space-time correlation function between traces operators. Uh, so one in place i x and the other space at place at place y. So it's you know this would be like a tensor network which you want to contract in order to calculate this. And now the point of this uh, 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 of this dual unitaries is now, you know, I mean the unitarity basically gives you the causal cone in this type of uh, uh, in this type of uh, uh, brickwork circuits. But now dual unitarity gives you a complementary causal cone. So now the correlations can only spread in the intersection of these two causal cones, which is just a light ray. So basically the only non-zero correlations are these, but these are just given by CPMs, right? These are just given by powering of these CPMs, which is plugging the operator here, you get another operator there. So this is just Steinstein representation of this CPM. And you know, you get you could characterize it completely by, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, this is like a four by four matrix, right? And one eigenvector is unity, but this is unital trace preserving CPM. So one eigenvector is unit, unit matrix. Uh, we know that this eigenvalue is one. Now the question is, what are the other eigenvalues? And this completely gives, and this completely characterizes the case, the K of correlations, right? For non, for traces operators. So, for example, now you can just, you know, uh, basically just write arbitrary correlation function. Now, okay, first thing, of course, I, this I already said, correlation can only decay when the the, 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 the display, displacement between x and y is equal to plus minus t, and this then you call as correlation function c plus minus, and this is given in terms of this operator m plus and minus to power two t. So this is like a zero dimensional dynamics, right? You mapped one plus one D dimensional dynamics to a zero dimensional open system dynamics. And now diagonalizing this through four by four matrix, uh, getting its spectrum, which I denote like lambda plus alpha, lambda minus alpha, alpha is one to three or four if you want, but one eigenvalue is trivial. You could completely you know, decompose you know, any correlation functions. And now you can see that just playing with this uh, unitaries, dual unitaries, you can get all possible kind of dynamics you get completely non-interacting dynamics, which is, for example, represented by swaps. Swap is just, you know, no, nothing the case. All eigenvalues are equal to one. Then you can get non-ergodic non dynamics, but in general, non-integrable, when at least one additional eigenvalue is equal to one, which means the corresponding traces operator doesn't decay. Or you could get, for example, quasi-time uh, crystal uh, behavior, where, for example, there is an eigenvalue, which is not one, but it's at unit circle. This means that the corresponding mode uh, indefinitely oscillates in time. Or you could get what people would call in you know, ergodic theory, ergodic and mixing behavior, when all non-trivial eigenvalues are slickly inside unit circle. Then you get exponential decay of correlations. For example, that could be useful. I mean, I'm just telling you now because I have to close soon, but that could be useful, for example, if you want to control uh, statements like ETH, for example, right? I mean, you have uh, uh, matrix elements of operators which are for correlation, with correlations which decay exponentially, then you can immediately make observations about uh, um, uh, spectral functions and, and distribution of matrix elements. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, yeah, the last slide before I go into some brief info on perturbation stability is just uh, explaining how we classify this completely for dual unit for, 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 for qubits. I mean, this is an interesting problem. So I'm, I mean, I'm very happy to discuss with anyone who's interested, but you know, that's, I mean, I'm, we are working on it, but we have no results. I mean, I guess it's a hard problem, so we are not kind of so desperate about it, but uh, I mean, the problem is to characterize the set of dual unitaries for arbitrary D. I mean, it's not a nice set, it's a manifold, but it's not a nice set, it's not a group. Uh, but for example, for D equal to two, I mean, there is this nicer parameterization for SU4 or for U4 in terms of, you know, direct product of two SU2s uh, times a Heisenberg gate, another type direct product of two SU2s. And then dual unitarity just fixes two parameters in the Heisenberg gate to power four. And the third parameter is still free. So it basically is a co-dimension two manifold within SU4 or U4. So it's not so fine-tuned. For example, there are examples like swaps, like Heisenberg gate for JX, JY equal to 4 of 4, or self-dual QTZ model, for example. These are just a few examples. Integrable, non-interacting, and chaotic. Now there is an interesting, interesting paper recently again by, by Austin Lamacraft, uh, published in PRL last week or this week. Uh, where they proposed a, a class of higher D uh, dual unitaries, but it's a restricted class. It's not a complete classification. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to scoot that. This is uh, one slide on what we can do in general. We cannot do much, just some numerics and some, some, some conjectures. So I'm going to skip that. And that's, of course, a very, it's, it's of course, a million dollar question because uh, if we could control uh, what we can do with this for genetic circuits, we could maybe make some exact handles on statements like uh, MBA, I mean, on 
phenomenon like MBL, but of course it's beyond reach at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> but then of course, what we can do also is to make some observations about operator spreading and operator entanglement. There are even some interesting phase transitions in the strength of, uh, or in the slope of uh, growth of any entropies or operator any entropies when you change this parameter J, which is this parameter in our classification. <clears throat> And, but I'm not going into that because I want to close in like what, three, four, three, four minutes? Do I still have, Thomas? Two, no, one or two? One, okay, so yeah. Two, two is fine, two is fine. Uh, okay, I mean, let, let me just, let me just flash one or, one or two slides, you know, because now I, I probably already motivated you. Uh, I mean, in, my, in the beginning of my talk, I already motivated at least myself, hopefully also you that, why is this exciting? And the, the main thing I think, why I think it's exciting because it, it has potential to be structurally stable. Even though it's so fine-tuned, you know, things in physics which are structurally stable are really cool, right? And they're probably more important than things which are fragile. So now <clears throat> let me just, you know, tell you why, why, we think that, why we think that and how we approach that problem. So let me just write now the correlation function. We, what we can do now is just some modest statements about how to compute correlation functions in perturbed dual unitary circuits. So now we take, first we take this folded uh, circuit picture. So now we just fold this, I mean, I have no time to explain, but uh, most of you, I guess, understand this the notion of folded circuits. So we just take uh, U and U dagger on top of each other, right? And you take doubled wires. And then basically the, the, the correlation function now is just contracting the circuit. This is already, uh, this is a generic, this is not dual unitary. The green is generic, but the red, the, the, the yellow is dual unitary. So now the, the unitarity is, is just unitality of this folded operator circuit. And dual unitarity is just sideways, sideways unitality. So now you have these four diagrams, which are replacing previous diagrams for the states. Now this is, this is now operators for the, I mean, maps for the operators. Now A and B are now two operator states, if you want. And this would be now a generic correlation function, right? I mean, if this, this green would be, would, be, would, be, would, be, would be yellow, then this, this should contract only uh, along, uh, along 1D, but otherwise it, it, it will have to contract this type of of beast, right? Now, suppose now you want to, to make st a statement about, you know, uh, a gate which can be written as a small perturbation of dual unitaries. So dual unity times e to the i theta p, p Hermitian and eta small. And now, you know, the simplest situation is that just think of having a zero density, small density of perturbed gates, right? These are like impurities. Now, basically what you have is basically a, a reduction of this correlation function to a path integral formula, which basically has a scattering on impurities, right? And then the next thing, step is just to show that you get convergent expansion in this, this type, in, 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 this, in this spirit. And I have only time to, 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 to say that, yes, that we can do that, but in a very restricted setting. We, we first have to consider noisy, noisy, noisy circuits where we take, uh, 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 let's say, longitudinal noise, noise within fixed uh, random field. So, so fixed random field in Z direction, for example. I mean, in that, okay, so I, I think I'm just too ambitious, so I cannot really uh, go into detail, but, you know, I was, ju I was just wanting to, to show you some simple, you know, diagrammatics, how to, how to, how to reduce uh, computation of correlation function to the problem of tilings uh, uh, with some, you know, uh, but yeah, I probably I'm just, uh, I should probably close and uh, I'm happy to discuss it in the breakout, breakout room, but uh, uh, <clears throat> There is, there, was a, there is a kind of a theorem which we can uh, prove, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, it would, it would uh, take me beyond the... So I'll just close, I'll just conclude. So uh, what I hope I convinced you that uh, these are kind of exciting results on extended quantum lattice systems, uh, you know, um, which are non-integrable, non-free, strongly interacting, in fact. Uh, the results are only possible because we take thermodynamic limit first. So any, any, any statements where, where we require time to infinite limit first or scaled, scaled limits T over L fixed or something. I mean, these are beyond reach at the moment, uh, but still, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I think the interesting set of results. So, uh, <clears throat> and uh, definitely the most kind of uh, exciting, I think as already said a couple of times is structural stability, but of course there are many challenging for future work, many, many challenges for future work. For example, first, uh, uh, how to control finite size corrections, uh, how to, you know, approach the problem of EDH uh, which would allow, which would require to control limit to infinity before L to infinity. And uh, well, the obvious thing to do, which is kind of without, has no problem, just, you know, requires uh, PhD students and time is to extend all that in dual unitary, uh, in, 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 to, in, in, in those stochastic quantum systems, let's say. I mean, <clears throat> systems with measurements, if you want, and so on. Okay, thank you for your attention.